well, thanks, thanks very much. Um, Eric has encouraged me not to dawdle <laughs> for the same reason if it, you know, we don't want to get too dark. He also implied you could leave in the middle. You can't. <laughs> Nobody leaves. You know. Actually, if you got it, you got to go. I understand. Uh, so we'll, we'll just get right into it. Um, I, I'm calling tonight's talk A Chickadee's Guide to Gardening. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to reverse the perspective. We normally look at our properties from what, what can they do for us. And they can do a lot of things for us. And I'll work that in too. But if we want to share our properties with other li living things, we have to think about what those other living things need. So I'm going to march through a year uh, looking at primarily what birds need. Because if we, if we restore landscapes for birds, we have restored landscapes for a lot of things. Um, oh, well, well, we'll slip in a few other creatures as, as well. So the first thing I want you to do is pretend that you are this bird. What is, what is that bird? Black-throated green. Am I standing in front of you? Yes, I am. You're all black-throated green warblers. And you have just finished overwintering in the forest the, uh, of, of Central America. You can't hear me. Yeah. Partially because you talk a little fast sometimes. Yes, I talk fast all the time. <laughs> I can't move over there, right, because you're all... Can, can you follow me if I move over here? All right. Yeah, I don't project as well as I should. So thank you. Good. You're still a black-throated green warbler. And you are still overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica. Uh, but now it's time for you to migrate to, to uh, people say come home. You actually don't spend very much time in the north. Uh, you spend most of your time in, in Central America. But when you breed, you come north. So you're going to undergo the most dangerous thing that you'll ever do, and that is migration. Uh, but you are having a good flight. You are not one of the one billion birds to be killed by window strikes every year. That's billion with a B. And let me remind you, a billion is a thousand million. It's a lot of birds, a lot of birds. But that's not you. Um, you're also, oh, there's the take from one tower in uh, Toronto during migration. Uh, it's a serious, a serious problem. You're also not one of the 2.5 to 3 billion birds to be killed by house cats every year. And I can't take, talk too much about that because I get death threats if I do, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> or the 100 million birds to be hit by cards. So these are, these are the things that happen every year. Uh, on top of all the regular dangers from, from uh, migration, you're having a good, a good flight. You take off about 9 in, at night, and you fly essentially all night long until you run out of gas. Now, before you left the Yucatan Peninsula flying north, you ate as many insects as you could, and you built up fat, fat stores, but they're declining uh, on a regular basis. And every night, you have to come down after you've crossed the Gulf, and you've got to, or every morning, you've got to come down, you've got to rest, and you've got to eat, uh, and this is typically what you're eating. Now, a lot of people think that birds eat seeds and berries, but not during migration, not during spring migration. There aren't any seeds and berries. They're gone from the winter, and they haven't been produced yet. So they're refueling on insects. Um, so there you are. You're, you're uh, uh, flying. You have flown all night. It is about 4.30 in the morning, and now you're out of gas. You've got to come down. You've got to refuel, and you are in suburbia. So you come down where you are. Uh, now, you already know you're not going to get any food on, on those uh, calorie pair right there. Uh, or in the, uh, the cool season Eurasian grasses we use for lawn or the ornamental conifers that we have. You do have enough energy that you can look next door. Uh-oh. You can look across the street. Hmm. This is the neighborhood down the street from me. I didn't have to go very far to find this. This is the way we landscape almost everywhere. And of course, those landscapes are designed for beauty. They are not designed to help migrating birds, and we're literally starving our migrating birds. We're starving our resident birds as well, but they have the option of moving someplace else if there is, is someplace else. Now, we can, we can fix this. All we have to do is think about the plants that we put into our, our landscapes. And if we're doing that in order to help other things, we have to understand what those other things need. So that's why I am going to focus on, on birds, um, because they do have, have specific needs, and they're all tied directly to plants. You're not a black-throated green uh, warbler anymore. Now you are a chickadee. This is a Carolina chickadee. Um, up here would be a black-capped chickadee, but they're doing the same, same thing. 
Um, so let's march through a year looking for what chickadees need in our yards. And the first thing you're going to do is try to reproduce. Now, I don't mean fly down uh, you know, to the nearest woodlot fly five miles away. That's not in your yard. I want you to reproduce right in your yard. The first thing you need is a cavity, uh, but not just any cavity. That cavity is too big. You've got to find one that is the right size. That's, that's better. That looks good. Yep, that's good. <laughs> but cavities are in short supply. Mr. Titmouse wants that cavity too. So there's always a lot of competition. So if you have the option, uh, and a lot of people don't, but if you do have the option of leaving a snag, a dead, a dead tree in your, your yard, and I've even known people to put dead trees up in their yard. They stake them down so that they can get breeding birds. If you were to study that, there are a number of tree cavities. The woodpeckers come and then they create cavities for other things. You're really helping these birds out a lot. We've got 85 species of North American birds that breed in tree cavities and they're always in short supply. All right, you've got your tree cavity now. Now it's time to build your nest. Uh, now you could build it out of horse hair. Uh, so if you put a horse in your front yard, that would be good. <laughs> Um, if that doesn't work, you could try cat hair. What we do is we brush our cat uh, and put the hair out on the back porch. We put the hair in the back porch, not the cat. <laughs> and the chickadees come and, and make their nest out of it. Or you can go to Wild Birds, uh, Wild Birds Unlimited, is that what it is? And buy a hairball. Why not? And hang it up. <laughs> and the birds love that as well. Okay, you've made your nest, you've laid your eggs. Um, now comes the hard part. Those eggs are going to hatch and you have to feed these, these birds. And a lot, of, again, people think chickadees are seed eaters because they are at our, our bird seed feeders all winter long, eating seed. But when they're making more chickadees, when they're reproducing, they're not feeding them seed, they're feeding them caterpillars. And if you live in a, a, a rich habitat, you're gonna feed your, your young exclusively on caterpillars. Um, so we might want, and you know what, you're not an exception. Most, about 80% of the terrestrial birds in North America rear their young, not just on insects, but on caterpillars. So why caterpillars? What's specially, what is special about caterpillars? Well, it could be because they're beautiful. We've got a lot of beautiful caterpillars. We've got the fawn sphinx. I think that's art in the garden. We've got the Pandora sphinx and the spingicampa caterpillar, the spiny rose caterpillar, Coletta silk moth, the smeared dagger moth, the hieroglyphic moth, the purple crested slug, the spun glass caterpillar. These are all really pretty caterpillars. Could be because they have cool names, <coughs> like the green marvel, the once charred punky, <laughs> the confused wood grain, the cynical ground cat, the turbulent phosphilla, the neighbor, the Donald. You know, sometimes we just have to laugh. You know? <laughs> but actually, I don't, I don't think it's because they have cool names or, or because they're pretty. I think uh, one of the reasons that there many, most caterpillars are soft, and that means you can stuff it down the throat of your, your young. <laughs> it's a very practical reason without injuring your, your baby. Um, the other is that they're just really nutritious. They're high in protein, they're high in, in lipids and fats, and they're also the best source of carotenoids when these birds are breeding. Now, later on in the season, birds uh, get a lot of their carotenoids from berries. But the berries haven't been made yet in the spring. Uh, so best uh, source of carotenoids. Who cares about carotenoids? Well, those are compounds made by plants, only by plants. Vertebrates don't make them. Uh, and a number of them turn out to be essential for good diets. Uh, and that's why my wife Cindy tells me I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene. I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. <laughs> And she makes me eat all this, this stuff. But why do I need that? I need it because these are antioxidants. They run around our bodies and they, they uh, repair um, damaged DNA uh, that's been damaged from, from oxidation. They stimulate the immune system. They improve color vision. So when your mother said that you have to uh, uh, eat your, your carrots for your, your eyesight, she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? Improves sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about birds here. They're taking the, the pigments from carotenoids and putting them into their, their feathers. So that's why this the scarlet tanager here is very, very red. And of course, the, redder, the reddest male gets the most, the most females. 
Well, chickadees don't, don't make their own carotenoids. They're vertebrates. They're not making them. They've got to get them from plants. They're not eating plants when they're reproducing, so they've got to get them from something that does eat plants, and that something, of course, is insects. But here's the key. Caterpillars have twice as many carotenoids as, as other insects. We're not sure why, and that includes spiders in there as well. But they do. Uh, so it seems that caterpillars are essential parts of, of the chickadee diet, of all these breeding birds. They absolutely have to have caterpillars. And that means if you live in an area where there's not enough caterpillars, you're not going to be able to successfully reproduce. So that's the next question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of, of chickadees? It takes a lot. Um, and it was these birds that, that taught me that. I put a little chickadee feeder up in my yard and set up my camera so I could, I could see what they were bringing back to the nest. That's when I learned they were bringing back caterpillars, but I also learned they were bringing them back really quickly. One caterpillar every three minutes. The male and the female are cooperating when they're, they're foraging, so somebody's always out looking for a caterpillar. In one 27-minute period, they brought back 30 caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time, sometimes a whole bunch. <laughs> And they're doing this all day long, eight, eight a, yeah, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So they're working very hard. All right, next question is, how many species of caterpillars are they bringing back? Uh, well, in three hours, just three hours, they brought back 17 different species of caterpillars. Now, remember, they are foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to get the, uh, to the nearest woodlot. Why? are the number of species important? Well, if I had one or two species of uh, caterpillars in my yard, and it happened to be a bad year for those particular species, all species fluctuate. Sometimes there are a lot, sometimes there's just a few, and a lot of it is weather dependent. This year has been lousy at my house for caterpillars. It's been cold and wet, and there are very few caterpillars. If I had one or two species, it wouldn't be nearly enough for these guys to reproduce successfully. But if I have 17 species, or 34 species, or 134 species, There'll always be some combination of species that will be common enough so the chickadees will be able to reproduce. So all I'm saying here is that diversity creates stability in this food web. Diversity creates stability in your ecosystem. That's why we want complex ecosystems that are filled with lots of species. All right, a guy by the name of Brewer back in 1961, for some reason, I don't know what it was, decided he wanted to know how many caterpillars Carolina chickadees bring back to the nest every day, and he found out it was between 390 and 570, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And they're in the nest, on average, for 16 days. Now, after they, they fledge, the parents bring caterpillars for another 30 days to the, to the babies, but they're flying all over, so nobody can count them. Nobody knows how many. But just until they fledge, it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. Again, depending on how many chicks are in the nest. And these are tiny birds. Oh, there it is after he's fledged. He's still, still a tiny bird, eating, eating caterpillars. Um, third of an ounce, that's four pennies worth of, worth of bird. What if we wanted to make a red-bellied woodpecker eight times bigger than a chickadee? How many caterpillars does that take? And we don't want just chickadees and, and red-bellied woodpeckers. We want titmice, and we want blue jays, and bluebirds, and tree swallows, and common yellow throats, and indigo bunnings, and yellow warblers, and wood thrushes, and cardinals, and hummingbirds. These are all common birds that we expect to be in our neighborhoods. And we don't want one pair of each. We want breeding populations. Just imagine the tremendous number of cat caterpillars where we live has to produce. It's a different way of thinking about landscapes. Uh, and the fact that, insect, that, that birds are, are rearing their young in insects, um, it is a fact. 96% of all the terrestrial birds in North America rear their young in insects, and the book will say other arthropods. Those other arthropods typically are spiders, but spiders needed insects to become spiders. Uh, and, and, you know, this is news to a lot of people because we always think of birds as eating seeds and berries. If we read a Landscape for Birds book, it's about putting plants in your, your yard that make seeds and berries. And that's good. That's good. But you also have to put the plants in your yard that make the insects that allow these guys to reproduce. Because even the seed and berry eaters are eating insects when they're reproducing. And I forgot to tell you, that includes Mr. Hummingbird here. We all think of him as a, a, a nectar specialist. Because they do eat nectar all the time. But 80 to 90% of their diet is insects and spiders. Again, we don't think about that. So there you go, no insects, no baby birds. All right, how do we do that? What types of landscapes are capable of making the diversity and abundance of insects that we're talking about? 
Um, well, to answer that question, we have to consider the most common type of specialized relationship that occurs all over the planet. And that's the relationship between the insects that eat plants, things like this, this polyphemus caterpillar, and the plants that they're eating, like the oak tree that he's eating. I'm not talking about pollinators here. I'm talking about insect herbivores. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their, their tissues with, with uh, nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that are either bitter or downright toxic. And it's an amazingly effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants. That's why I can, I can look outside, look, it's green. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those particular plants. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. They become what we call host plant specialists. They develop the adaptations that are required to get around the chemical defenses of just a few types of plants, usually one or two lineages of plants that are sharing the same type of defense. They develop the enzymes and the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations um, that uh, allow them to eat these compounds without dying. But it takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. Let's use uh, red cedar, eastern red cedar, as an example. It's a conifer. It's been in our landscapes for uh, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, actually, uh, interacting with local in insects for many, many millions of years. You would think that is plenty of time for all those insects to adapt to the defenses of red cedar. But they haven't. Very few have been able to adapt because it's found a, a really effective one, a toxic monoterpene called beta thuyaplixin. It keeps almost all the insects off of it. But this is one that has adapted. This is the juniper hair streak. It is a specialist on red cedar. And all that means is it has figured out how to eat beta thuyaplixin without dying. That's the upside of specialization. The downside of specialization is that in figuring out how to get around beta thuyaplixin, it has not figured out how to get around anything else. So it can't eat oak trees because oaks have tannins and it doesn't know how to deal with them. It can't eat, eat uh, your, your squashes in your yard because they've got cucurbitacins and they don't know how to deal with them and on and on and on. And that means if we don't include red cedar in our landscapes, we lose that butterfly. That's what specialization means. They have to have what they specialized on. Now, if you're going to specialize, you might as well look like what you're specializing on so the birds can't find you. There's the caterpillar right there. This is called crypsis. And it turns out everything that eats red cedar is highly cryptic. This is the curved line angle, caterpillar that would be very tough to find. Um, another specialist on red cedar. And here's the juniper geometer, which blends in with the dead parts of, of red cedar. Um, so that is, uh, that is uh, specialization at its best. Well, in today's world, specialization has become a curse because we haven't thought about it in moving plants around our, our yards, our neighborhoods, around our continents. Uh, if, you, if you actually analyze most of the plants that you use in your yard, uh, it turns out, at least from what we've measured, a little farther south, it's about 80%. 80% of the plants you have in your yard are from China. Well, that doesn't include all of our specialists here from, from North America, like Mr. Monarch Butterfly, or maybe that's Mrs. Um, specialization has clobbered the monarch. It's a specialist on milkweed. And that means if you don't have milkweed, you don't have monarchs. And of course, we have taken away the milkweeds from an awful lot of places. Um, and that is why the monarch, as of two winters ago, was down to 3.6% of the population size that, that it was in 1976. <coughs> Uh, you know, statistics like uh, Iowa, the state of Iowa has lost 82% of its milkweeds in 10 years. Why? Because we have Roundup Ready corn and soybeans that uh, have taken away where most of the monarchs, where most of the milkweeds have, have uh, coexisted with agriculture on the sides of the, the uh, plantings. We've never shared our residential neighborhoods very, very well with, with milkweeds. Uh, but we've also, we've, we've treated this as a learning experience. We figured out we can do that. Um, it's really not hard to plant milkweeds, get them going. We've got some good milkweed patches right here on, on this property, and you can do that at home and give the monarch a fighting chance. Now, that is half the story with the monarch. Um, it requires milkweeds to grow and, and reproduce. This is a problem. And while we're dealing with that, 
The other half of the problem is that uh, the monarchs then migrate. They're probably the most iconic insect in the world because they've got a mig migration of, you know, what, 3,000 miles? They're going all the way to, to Mexico if you start up this, this far north. And on the way, they're done with milkweeds. They're not reproducing anymore. They don't need milkweeds anymore. They need plants that are making nectar that will power that migration. Things like goldenrod, things like fall asters, things like the fall blooming plants that we have to have in our landscapes. So there's an awful lot of press about putting the milkweeds back into the landscape. Absolutely, we have to do that, but that's half of the story. We also have to put all of those fall blooming plants back, back too. Yes? I have a question. Is there no bird hereabouts that specializes in uh, gypsy moth larvae or winter moth larvae? <laughs> <laughs> there actually is. There are two birds, uh, the black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoo. Love, you know, it's not that they're, they're larvae from someplace else, it's that they're hairy. And uh, most birds can't deal with hairy larvae because the hairs come off in their, um, in their gut. And the cuckoos have figured out how to shed the lining of their esophagus and their stomach. And they do that periodically so that they can, they can, they specialize on these, these hairy caterpillars. And they actually will follow gypsy moth outbreaks. Um, I, you know, I, I see no reason why they wouldn't be eating the, you know, the, the uh, other invasives from Europe, but I don't have any direct experience with that either. So, trouble is there are never enough black bill and yellow bill cuckoos. When we bring insects in from someplace else, we bring them in without their natural enemies. Uh, and, and birds are a big natural enemy source, but it's mostly the diseases and the, the um, parasitoids, the little, little wasps that are stinging those guys all the time that are keeping them under control. So the best thing is to not bring them in at all. Does yes. it matter if you have a hybrid or do you have to have a species for these like asters and other things? Um, all right, uh, you're talking about cultivars. That's the most common question I get. Are cultivars as good as a straight species? Now a hybrid is a cross between two different species. So if you cross a native with a non-native, um, it's only half a native at that point. It typically messes up the, the genetics of the plant, the chemistry of the plant so much that the insects won't be able to, to deal with it. Uh, we're gonna move right along here since we're back. Uh, and, and I'll get to the, the end of that question later on. Okay, monarchs, we're, now, yeah, so a lot of people say insects can adapt. They can adapt to anything because we have so many examples of insects forming resistance to pesticides, um, that is true. But when it comes to adopting a new host, not true. The monarch is going to disappear long before it starts eating corn or soybeans or oak trees or anything else. They've been locked into those lineages for millions of years. They're not going to change in 10 years. So these insects will disappear long before they actually form new host associations. And we have to be sensitive to that. Knowledge of these specialized relationships will allow us to rebuild food webs wherever we want. Let's do it at, at home if we understand what the food webs are, are comprised of. Let's look at the white-eyed vireo uh, as an example. That's the nest that my, my wife found uh, in, in our yard. And fortunately, it was low. Those vireos are building them nice and low, and I could again set up my camera, take pictures of the caterpillars that the babies are, the adults are bringing back to the young, uh, and then we can identify those caterpillars. Then we'll know what those caterpillars ate. We've got very good knowledge of, of what plants create different species of, of caterpillars. Then we know what plants are gonna drive the food web of the white-eyed vireo. So let's, let's do this for a while. This caterpillar is the blinded sphinx moth. It is a specialist on black cherry. We have a lot of black cherry at home. It's making blinded sphinx moths so the babies get to eat. This guy's the chestnut chisura, and despite its common name chestnut here, it's a specialist on native viburnums. In our yard, that's viburnum dentatum. Our yard's mowed for hay. It was mowed for hay before we moved in, and, and we know what plants are there because we put most of them there. The viburnum that's there is the one we planted, viburnum dentatum, making chestnut chisuras, and the babies get to, get to eat again. This guy's a, a, a drab prominent specialist on sycamore. We got sycamore because a wind blew in some sycamore seeds about 13 years ago. One landed in my cold frame, germinated. Um, it's about 40 feet tall now because I'm not very fast at weeding things out, and it is making drab prominence so the babies get to eat again. There's a good side to every story. And you can go on and on. This is the, the uh, eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on native grapes. We've got them. Uh, the lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. The, the spicebush swallowtail, there's this little eye, supposed to make this, this, the bird think it's a tree snake. 
and scare it away. Didn't work. <laughs> it's suspicious on spicebush and its close relative sassafras. We have both of those plants. The tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherry is emerging as a really important component of this bird's food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut into the landscape. We can get the walnut sphinx, the gray-edged boma loca, the black blotch caesura, the bride. These are all specialists on black walnut where I come from. If you have native maples, you can have plagodes inchworms, green striped maple worm, the retarded dagger moth, native elms. This is the American elm. Give you the four horn sphinx, double tooth prominent, and many others. Remember, 90% of the insects that you might rebuild this food web with will not be or stay in your yard if you don't have the plants that support their larval development. So if you want the mustard sallow, you need uh, witch hazel. If you want the hackberry emperor, you need hackberry. If you want coculio asteroides, you need native asters. Uh, if you want the, the showy emerald, you need roos, you need, you need uh, sumac. That's what it specializes on. The Arcidra flower moth, the brown hooded owlet need goldenrod, the, the hog sphinx, the Pandora sphinx, the abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. The red bud leaf roller needs red bud, the gray furcula needs native willows, and the, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pig striped oak worm, the pleasant dagger moth, the delightful dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the red, the, the white patched uh, heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and many, many more won't be there if you don't have oaks. Because where I come from, oaks is the, the most powerful plant you can put into the landscape. Where you come from, it's willows. Oaks are number two. Oaks are number two. By the way, you know where I took all those pictures? My front yard. I took them in my front yard. <laughs> We're not going to talk about backyard habitat because that implies everything I'm, I'm saying is so ugly, we have to hide it in the backyard. What is wrong with front yard habitat? Put your oak in your front yard. Everybody will love it. It'll be good. Now, sometimes we already know what a bird eats. So we don't have to recreate the food web. We, well, we have to build that food web, but we don't have to figure out what it is. And that is true for the night jars. Things like uh, whippoorwills and chuckwills widows. Um, these are birds that fly around at dusk and at night, and they eat large night-flying moths. Things like the, the uh, Saturnians, the family Saturnia, the giant silk moths. Now, they'll eat any, any large moth that's flying around, but these are the guys that really fuel their... their um, diet. So let's take a habitat like this and purposely turn it into a Saturnid kingdom, heaven. You know, we'll create everything Saturnids need here. And if we do that, we're going to help the, the uh, whippoorwills. So let's put some sweet gum into that landscape. Uh, if we do that, we get the Luna moth. Um, now, you know, you have to do this in a biome uh, appropriate way. So everybody doesn't have sweet gum. You guys are way up in the north here. You should move farther south. You can have a lot more plants. Uh, the native prunus, the, the black cherry, uh, um, pin cherry, uh, Chickasaw plum, American plum, beach plum, those are all, all prunus. Um, they give us a lot of things. They give us the io moth, the promethea moth, the cecropia moth. And you do have those up here. Oaks will give you the buck moth and the polyphemus moth. Um, pines, we certainly have pines. We'll give you the imperial moth. Uh, hickories uh, and walnuts actually give you the, the hickory horn devil or royal walnut moth, depending on which name you like best. Tulip trees will give us the tulip tree silk moth. Native maples will give us the uh, rosy maple moth. The honey locust will give us the bisected honey locust moth. So those are the, the common Saturnians you would get in this area, and you can really pack them into your, your landscape. But you have to turn off your security light, or at least make it a motion sensor light, so that it only turns on when the bad guy comes. I presume that's why it's on. I know we like to light up the world because I don't know why, but, but we do. But these moths I'm talking about, they don't have any mouth parts. They're not eating as adults. They emerge as adults with all the food they're ever going to use, and they only live about a week, and if they spend all their energy flying around your light, they're done. That's it. And the, the, bat, the bat comes and picks them off. So these are, these are death traps for not just the big Saturnias, but for, for most of the night flying moths. If you want to restore food webs, you've got to, you've got to minimize the use of these things. So really, for security, make it a... a, a 
a motion sensor light, and then you'll actually trap the bad guy because he won't be able to sneak around the shadows because he knows where they are. That's the hickory horned devil. That's the larva of the royal walnut moth. It is already extirpated from New England. So I'm sorry, guys, you've already lost him. Uh, but you might be able to put him back if you watch those security lights. All right, now we can actually measure what happens to all those native plant communities that are, are supporting all of these specialized relationships when we replace them with non-native plants that aren't supporting these specialized relationships. And that's what we have been studying in my, my lab for the last uh, 12 years now, I guess. Um, we have several uh, papers published in scientific journals and you can read them. Um, I know you're not gonna read them, but we always get the same answer, so that's, that's good. And I thought it, it'd be better to, to um, tell what I mean, is to actually go out and test this for yourself. Don't believe me. Test this for yourself. This is the 12 by 12 experiment. You can do it at home or you can get your school kids to do it. Um, that's what 12 feet by 12 feet looks like if you stake it out in your yard. And you get to control the life that is in that space by controlling what plants you put in that space. You can keep it as lawn and you can get on your hands and knees on Wednesday and count all the biodiversity in the lawn. It won't take you long. And then of course on Saturday you're going to mow it and kill it all. Or you could put an oak tree in your yard. Um, so this is a white oak. It's one I planted from an acorn 14 years before I took this picture. It's 25 feet tall, and it actually proves two things. First, that oaks grow. Uh, you know, I hear so many landscapers tell people, do not plant an oak. You won't live long enough to enjoy it. I'm enjoying it, and I'm not, I'm not dead yet. The other thing is, it doesn't, well, it doesn't have to be 300 years before the oak is functioning like an oak and, and, and being something majestic that you can enjoy. You can enjoy it right, right now. And I was enjoying it right from the minute that it, it germinated. The other thing is it was free, and that's a, that's a big thing. Because if you were to put a, a tree like that in your yard, you know, four-inch caliper, uh, what would it cost you? I don't know, $1,500, $2,500. 50% chance that it would die because it's so root-prone to move it, all because we want instant gratification. Uh, but then it's stalled. It's got to rebuild those roots. It takes at least a decade to do that. So plant young and small. You will get a big, a big tree. One little, little side story here. I planted, um, somebody gave me a, a, I think it was a 15-foot red oak because they couldn't sell it. And it was going to die. They had already dug it. And they said, do you want it? I said, sure. Um, so we dug this giant hole. You know, big deal. We got it, got it in there. The same day, I planted an acorn of a willow oak. They're tiny. Uh, and, and the guy asked me, what are you doing that for? Uh, I said, well, I've got these acorns. I'm going to plant it. You know? He said, well, that, you know, that's a waste of time. Um, today, those trees are the same size. Uh, that, was, that was, yeah, 13 years ago. And the red oak is going to die. It's got lesions all over it. The, the willow oak is much healthier. The red oak has just sat there for the most part. You know, it's a little bit taller. But a little bit of patience and you get healthy trees. Okay, back to our 12 by 12 experiment. Let's walk around the perimeter of that tree and count the caterpillars that are on, on the branches. Just at head height, we're not climbing ladders or anything. So we are talking about the caterpillars here. We're not talking about everything that's up here. Who knows what's up there? And let's do it on July 25th of 2014. We're gonna find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. Then let's step back and take that picture so that I can ask you, how many caterpillars do you see? <laughs> how much caterpillar damage do you see? And this is the distance that we view our trees. There are caterpillars on there. There are some holes in those leaves, but we can't see it. We don't care. It's still just as pretty as if we didn't know there were any caterpillars. But if I knocked on your door and said you got 410 caterpillars on your, on your tree, we'd all freak out. We'd get our spray cans, got to save, save the tree. The oak is doing its job. It's taking some of its energy that it's gotten from the sun and passed it on to those caterpillars so that they're now in the belly of a bird and you've got a functional food web in your yard. Okay, let's go to a black cherry, about the same size, 12 by 12, walk around the, the edge, count the caterpillars, 239 caterpillars from 14 different species. Now let's go to my neighbor's house and count one of his calorie pears. Um, first we have to decide which calorie pear, because he's got 32 of them. <laughs> Actually, first we have to make sure he's not home. <laughs> he's not home, so we can count this one. Let's walk around uh, and, and uh, well, you know, he could have been home. He's never out walking on his grass. You'd never know. So, <laughs> Count the caterpillars. I did find a caterpillar. I found one inchworm, one species. 
on the calorie pair. Then I went to his burning bush. He's got a giant row of burning bush. By the way, I spend the rest of my life weeding out his calorie pairs and, and burning bushes from my yard. Um, those are gifts. <laughs> 12 by 12 section, count the caterpillars. I got four caterpillars, one species, uh, and these are little leaf skeletonizers that are really not participating in, in the local food web. What if that was a fluke? What if I just happened to pick a really uh, productive red or white oak and, and black cherry in my yard and a really unproductive Bradford pear or calorie pear and burning bush in his yard? Let's do it again the next day, July 26. Same species, different plants. And we get the same pattern, different numbers. We get 233 caterpillars on the white oak, 53 in the black cherry, two in the burning bush, one on the, the calorie pear. And that's the pattern you will get. I don't care how many times you do it, you're gonna get a lot of food produced by the powerhouse genera of native plants that are driving the food webs in our landscapes and very few produced by the plants from outside of our local food webs. These are not evil plants. In, in Asia, they're supporting food webs just fine, but we've taken them out of their, their ecosystem and put them over here. They don't know anybody, so they don't have any friends. <laughs> Rick Dark and I gave a talk in, in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, last spring, and then we drove up across the Bay Bridge up the eastern shore of, of uh, Virginia and, and uh, Maryland and Delaware as we were going home. And we got to the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill and here are all the calorie pears in bloom. And it's obvious why people plant these. Every, every landscape designer I meet, they say, oh, we don't use that anymore. And every development I go to is filled with brand new Bradford pears. So somebody's using them. It's probably the cheapest tree you can get. Um, but it's got a beautiful bloom. It's got nice fall color until you get the ice storm and then it falls over and, and that's the end of that. It doesn't live very long. But anyway, the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill has landscaped almost exclusively with calorie pears. We kept driving right past this building and we hit, we hit this. This is, this is, I don't know how many acres owned by a land conservancy I have learned. And it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from those calorie pears. So that is the dilemma we have to think about now. These guys have the right to put any plant on their property that they want. But do they have the right to biologically pollute all of the land around them with a plant that's making one one caterpillar. Now, if the calorie pear was the ecological equivalent of the native plants it's displacing, this landscape would look like calorie pears, but it'd be just as productive. The birds would still be able to breed here, and ecologically, we wouldn't know the difference. But it's not. It's not nearly as productive as the native plants that could, could be there. And that's the problem. Okay, which trees should we be sure to have in our landscapes? Um, we have made a lot of lists in my lab. This is the first list we made this is a list of all of the uh, plant genera that occur in the mid-Atlantic states. Now, it doesn't include Maine, but the, the numbers in parentheses after each plant genus are the number of species of caterpillars recorded in the literature as being able to, to make a living on that particular plant. So memorize that. <laughs> why, why would we do this? Well, this allows us to see which are the most productive plants and which ones aren't contributing. That, that much. This was back in the days where we still were trying to demonstrate to people that natives are important and these other plants are not helping things very much. I had a lot of non-believers out there. Uh, but this has become really popular and every, every state I go they say, well, where's our list? Where's our list? And, and um, my, list? yeah. <laughs> well, Kimberly Shropshire, who was my technician, made this list. It took her two years, 4,000 references, and I used to tell people, hire Kimberly and she will make you a list. Uh, but the Forest Service said, we will fund Kimberly for one year and we want a list for every state. Actually, we want a list for every county in every state. I have a lot of trouble funding Kimberly, so I wasn't about to turn that down. So I said to Kimberly, can you do that? And she said, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she couldn't do it. It took her a year and a half, uh, but she did do it. And the, the National Wildlife Federation actually brokered this deal. So they're going to put this, everything Kimberly created, on their website. They're going to call it Native Plant Finder. Um, and they keep pushing the launch date back. It was supposed to be January 1st and April 1st and May 1st, then June 1st. Um, I don't even think they've dared to tell me July 1st at this point. But they found a major glitch. They're trying to, to work that out. But as soon as they do, you can, plant, you can type in your zip code and the rank list for your county will come up. The object is to be able to focus this in very close to where, where you live, both 
woody plants and herbaceous plants. Uh, and I can tell you what, what your uh, top, top ones are. Your best one, as I said, is, is willow, followed by oaks, followed by prunus, followed by poplars. Um, and they may not be the most uh, uh, widely used ornamental plants that you're used to, to having in your yard, but they are, are what we're calling foraging hubs. I'm finding out that, that there's just a few plant genera everywhere we go that are supporting most of, of the food. If you want to picture what a foraging hub looks like, go to your Delta magazine next time you fly. <laughs> These are the hubs for Delta, but let's make them foraging hubs. Each, each line there could be a bird or a lizard or something going in, or it could be a species of bird. Yes? That's a little farther down the list. They're important. They're, they're important. Um, so each dot here is another, another species of plant or another genus of plant, and the birds are going there but not very much because there's not very much food there. So imagine what would happen if we took these foraging hubs out of our landscape. We would still have dozens of other species of plants in our landscape, but it still would be a failed food web. So what I'm saying is here, diversity is good, we want diversity, but we, got, we have to include the foraging hubs if it's gonna be a functional landscape. Uh, and, and the bottom line is it turns out about 5% of the available genera in your area support about 75% of the food. There you go, 73% depending on, on uh, which biome you're, you're in. You can reverse that. That means 95% of the available plants, if you don't pick the foraging hubs, would only support 27% of, of the food. So in other words, it's really easy to go wrong if we don't plant these, these foraging hubs. And they exist, they exist everywhere. These are the different bioregions of the country. Uh, and we found that, that the foraging hubs here and here and here and here, the pattern is the same. They're all supporting, 5% is supporting about 73, 75% of, of the food. It doesn't matter what latitude you're in, whether it's north or south, and it doesn't matter how diverse, how many plant species they have. So this is a very consistent biological pattern, and we're not sure why, but there it is. So it doesn't matter where we go, we have to use those foraging hubs. Now the, the species of foraging hubs are going to change as you move across these bioregions. So all you have to do is find out the ones in, in your area. Now we're, we're um, nah, I'm a, I think this is New Orleans actually. New Orleans oaks are less important. They only support 367 species. Where I come from, they support 557. So their, their importance changes as you move around the country. But let's compare that to, to one of the favorite uh, landscape plants. Um, Cindy and I actually walked around Portland today and we were looking at the street trees. Um, you have some, you've got some ginkgos, ginkgo biloba <laughs> from Asia. Uh, four species recorded on, on ginkgo, uh, and you know they're all mistakes. Those are mistaken records. How do you get a mistaken record? Ginkgo, by the way, is from, from Asia. You wouldn't expect anything to be able to eat it, and they really can't. That's what the leaves look like. You get mistaken records because caterpillars don't often stay on the plant that they developed on. Like your monarchs, you get your monarchs eating your, your milkweed, but when it comes time for them to form their little chrysalis, they almost always crawl off the milkweed and make it someplace else. So when your monarchs disappear, it doesn't mean they've been eaten. It means they've gone to make a chrysalis someplace. Cecropia moth is one of these records. Uh, and, and just to show you how confident I am that Cecropia moths cannot eat ginkgos, I will give you $10,000 for every Cecropia moth you raise on ginkgo. And if you knew me, you'd know that's impossible. <laughs> so how does he get a record like that? Well, the ginkgos... The, the Cecropia moths grow on their favorite food, and where I live, that's, that's uh, black cherry. When they're finished developing, they've gotten to the size they need to be, they crawl off the plant and they walk for a given time period, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, then they stop and they spin their cocoon, wherever they are. I've got a Cecropia cocoon on my back porch right now. It wasn't eating my back porch. It just ended up and spun it. And I bet you one crawled up a ginkgo someplace. Somebody saw the cocoon and said, aha, they're eating ginkgo and recorded it in the literature. And that's how we get mistakes. Uh, but even if those are good records, four versus 557 or 300 and something, which would you put in your landscape if you're trying to rebuild those, those food webs? Number two in the list, um, now down in, in, in uh, New Orleans, it's really low, only 74 but in uh, it, at my house, 456. So um, it's still a very productive plant. Compare that to Zelkova, 
I saw some Zelkova in Portland here. You are using them. We use a ton of them down in, in uh, the mid-Atlantic states, I guess because it looks like the um, elm trees that we, we lost to Dutch elm disease. Zero caterpillars on, on Zelkova, zero native caterpillars on Zelkova. So this is what it always looks like, which means you could put in a plastic Zelkova or a silk Zelkova, <laughs> and it would contribute just as much to local food webs, and you wouldn't have to water it. For everybody who doesn't want any life in their yard, I don't know why they don't do that. Why, st why have a living thing if you want it to be dead? <laughs> this is Pieris japonica, uh, probably the most common foundation plant that we have in, in North America. Uh, we have a native Pieris. There's two species recorded on it. And this is to illustrate that all natives are not, not equally productive. Um, some don't support anything. They're native but they don't support anything. So the argument is not really native versus non-native. It is productive versus not productive. I don't think anything's on Pieris japonica itself. It could be a, a native viburnum, and you get 100, 103 species. So, so these are the decisions that we make every time we put a plant in our landscapes, at home, in our corporate landscapes, even here on, on uh, the Audubon property. We need to think of our, our trees, our plants, as if they are bird feeders, because that's what they are. They are bird feeders. There you go. <laughs> now you get to decide how well you're going to feed the birds. You can feed them a lot. You can feed them a little. And it's easy to find landscapes like this, giant lawns with, with almost no plants in them at all. Um, you can put seed in your bird feeders. The birds are not actually eating your feeders. They're eating the seed in your feeders. Or you can keep them empty. There's the ginkgo there. It's a big tree, <laughs> but it's not making any, any food. And we're not fooling the birds if we don't landscape in ways that include those, those foraging hubs. Here's some data from my, my PhD student, Desiree Narango, who's working in the uh, suburbs of Washington, D.C., on Carolina chickadees. She's following 92 pairs of breeding chickadees. Um, and, and comparing their breeding success with the landscape in which they have, have bred. She needs to see what types of landscapes are required for chickadees to successfully breed. This is the, uh, the star is where the nest is. The red line represents the foraging territory. So again, they're foraging about 50 meters from, from the nest. Uh, and the blue areas represent 95% of the foraging effort. So those are the plants on which they are getting the food when they're raising their young. Let's see what those plants are. Well, those are all of the natives in this, this neighborhood. Basswood and sweet gum, American elm. There's our friend, the black cherry, and two species of, of oaks. But there are a lot of other plants here they're not going to. What are they? Well, those are all the plants from Asia. Japanese maple, silk tree. There's our friend, the ginkgo, black poplar, crepe myrtle, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a, a um, landscape where those are the dominant trees. So actually, Cindy and I counted 177 trees today. We walked randomly, and about 75% were from Asia, which actually is a whole lot better than Portland, Oregon, where 92% are non-native. So I don't know. You're doing OK, I guess. But, <laughs> but not good enough for the chickadee. And then this is, this is what happens to, to uh, the chickadee. That's a failed nest. So uh, Desiree took the three dead chicks out of that nest and noticed a bunch of sunflower seeds in the bottom of the, of the nest. And what she thinks happened, I mean, this is anecdotal, but what she thinks happened is uh, they ran out of caterpillars and somebody had a bird feeder up with, with uh, sunflower seeds in them. So they tried to feed the baby sunflower seeds. They can't eat them, so the baby starved. And that's what happens when we don't landscape with these other creatures in mind. She's also looking at the migrating birds that come down. I remember, you're black-throated green, you come down to eat. 51 species have used her residential neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. You, you as a migrant are not flying through, around the cities. You're going right through them. You come down, and if you come down in the land of ginkgos, you're out of luck. And if that's all you can find, that's the end of your migration because you can't refuel. So a lot of people say, I do not have enough property to worry about breeding birds because it's not enough space for, for them to breed in. Um, and that, that could be true. But if you have space for one tree, you are contributing to the success or the failure of migrating birds. You want to put that, make that tree a productive uh, a cont contributor to what those migrants need. Another student of mine looked at where the migrants are actually foraging. These are plant families. I know you can't read them, but this is the Phagaceae, the oaks and the beaches. And in her study, there were no beaches. These are um, trees from graveyards. 
So these are, these are uh, managed plantings, but these are all the different families. And this is the number of minutes that migrants spent foraging in those trees. So these are, these are the oaks, and that's where they're going. Why are they going there? That's where the food is. If you're a bird, let's say you're a person, and you're going shopping for food, and you go to ShopRite, and there's no, no food on the shelves, how many times would you go back? It's the same thing with these birds. They do. They're not born knowing where the food is. They go into these different trees. If there's no food there, they're out of there because they cannot stand, they cannot survive if they spend more energy looking for food than the energy they get in return. It's called optimal foraging. They have to forage where there's the most food that's easiest to get. So oaks are extremely important in, in this particular landscape. Let's talk for a second about berries because it gets a little confusing here. We have a lot of non-native plants, and we have, you know, we have them because we brought them here as ornamentals, but the ones that are the most invasives make berries, and the birds eat those berries, and then they fly and they poop them out someplace. So that's oriental bittersweet and buckthorn and, and uh, autumn olive and, and um, um, bush honeysuckle. You know, they're, they're all making berries, and the birds are eating them. So the wildlife specialists throughout the east have planted these things. They say, hey, they're making a lot of good bird food, so we're going to plant them. All right, is that, is that true? Are they making good bird food? Well, what's going on here is a relationship between the plant and the seed disperser. The plant wants the bird to come and take its seed someplace far away from the parent plant. So it's wrapped the seed in a tasty morsel that we call a berry. And it wants this to be a long-term relationship. So uh, in a healthy seed dispersal relationship, the berry supplies the nutrition that the seed disperser, the bird, needs at the time of year that the berry is going to be dispersed. So if you're making a berry that needs to be dispersed in the summertime, like blueberry, you make it high in sugar, high in carbohydrates, because the birds have just come off their reproduction period where they're eating a lot of fat and a lot of protein, and now they have to get some carbohydrates. So, so blueberries, elderberry, great for, for summer dispersing bird activity. If you're making a berry that, that uh, wants to be dispersed in the fall, you want it to be high fat because birds are either migrating and they need that fat to complete their migration um, or they're not migrating and they need that fat to make it through, through the winter. So plants like poison ivy are great. They, they, you know, they, they make uh, very high fat berries and the birds all love them. Um, but that's what you want to make if you're a plant in the fall and you want your, your berry dispersed. If you want your berry dispersed in late winter, things like the, the uh, native hollies, Ilex verticillata or American holly, uh, you want your berry to, uh, to spike in carbohydrates late in the winter. It's frozen and thawed a number of times and then the carbohydrate, the, the sugar content rises because that's what birds want just before they start reproducing. They want that dose of, of carbohydrates. That's the sequence of nutrition that birds are looking for. Well, a woman by the name of, of Susan Smith, who has gotten married, I've got to learn her last name, uh, but she's at Cornell at this point, has been studying the nutritional value of native berries and non-native berries to see how they fit into this pattern. Here are native berries, wax, wax myrtle, 50% fat, exactly what, what the birds need. Native viburnums, 48.7, almost 49% fat. Spice bush, 48% fat. Native dogwoods, 35%. Even Virginia creeper, 24% fat. That's what our birds need in the fall because they're migrating or they're going to overwinter. Now here are, the, here are berries from, from uh, some of our worst invasives. Multiflora rose, 0.9%, less than 1% fat. Bush honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle, 0.7% fat. Buckthorn, 0.5% fat. Ugly Agnes, 2% fat. Oriental bittersweet, 2.6%. These guys are making high sugar berries in the fall. And that's not what the birds need in, in the fall. Um, so there are two reasons. People say, well, why? Why would a bird eat a high sugar berry in the fall if it needs high fat? There's two reasons. First of all, when you get invasions by these plants, often it's the only berry that's, that's there. So you get a buckthorn invasion, go to, go to Michigan and look at their buckthorn invasions, or go to Vermont, um, that's all that's there. So you're going to eat, eat the buckthorn for that reason. But they will eat it even if there's a choice, because it's high sugar. They eat high sugar berries for the same reason we do. It doesn't mean it's good for us. It tastes good, I guess. So the problem is that the pattern that's emerging is the, the berries primarily from Asia are phenologically out of sync 
uh, with the nutritional needs of, of our birds. They're producing high sugar berries in the fall instead of the summer. And buckthorn's particularly a particular problem. This is Remnus cathartica. Uh, it produces these dark berries, and when the birds eat them, they throw up about a half hour later. That's the dispersal mechanism for, for that plant, because the bird has moved in that half hour. Uh, but if you have a buckthorn invasion that's the only berry there, the birds are throwing up all day long. This is not good, not good for the birds. So be suspicious when somebody says, our birds need plants from China. What were they doing before we brought over those, those plants? I think they were doing better than they're doing right now. Okay, you're still a chickadee, it's fall, uh, and, and now, now we're done with insects. I mean, you've raised your young, you've, you've fed all those extra caterpillars to the, to the babies. They have learned to eat seeds. You have to get ready for the winter. Um, so you have to find a good seed source. Now, in the past, we had lots of patchy meadows around, even in the east. This notion that the squirrel could, could go from, from the Atlantic coast all the way to the Mississippi without touching the ground is probably incorrect. Uh, because back before we wiped out all the grazing mammals, there were a lot of open spaces. We had birds like the heath hen in the east. It was a prairie chicken that disappeared because we plowed up all, all the prairies. Um, so these meadows were common in, in the east, and they were producing all the seeds that these overwintering birds needed. But this is a hard landscape to get into suburbia. It, it really is. It's a challenge. This is the time you really might want to put it in your, your backyard. Uh, but there's still a number of plants we put commonly in our gardens that uh, supply a lot of seeds for our overwintering birds. Things like uh, um, black-eyed Susans and Joe Pieweed, um, New York Ironweed. These are all making thistle, your pasture thistles, making wonderful seed for the overwintering birds. So think about it before you, you deadhead or, or clean up your yard in the fall. Most of those ugly-looking seed heads are going to sustain the birds all winter long. But of course, you also have the option of putting up a, a bird feeder, and the chickadees will use that. And studies have shown that bird feeders done responsibly, where you're, you're cleaning them out and you're not, they don't have too many of them, where all the birds are giving each other diseases, actually do help the birds. They enter the, the breeding season heavier, they lay more eggs. Um, so it's a good idea to, to feed your, your birds in the wintertime. Have you ever watched what a chickadee does at the bird feeder? Now, a house finch goes and sits at the feeder and eats seed after seed after seed, not a chickadee. It's very cautious, it's looking around, takes a seed, but it doesn't eat it. It says, what am I gonna do with this seed? I am going to hide it. What they do, they know that there's a flush of seeds in the fall and then that's it. They're not produced the rest of the winter. So they've gotta take them and, and cache them in places that they can find them then later on in the winter. So they're hiding them all over your, your property as long as you give them places to, to hide them. So they're looking for nooks and crannies where they're gonna, gonna sneak that seed under the, the bark or in the, the tree hole. There they go, hiding it in there. But they have to be careful because Mr. Blue Jay's watching. <laughs> Blue Jays can be lazy devils and they watch those chickadees. And they say, I think there's a seed in this hole. Hmm, yes there is. <laughs> And now Mr. Chickie, he's got to go do it again. So he's going he's gonna to do it again, but this time he's going to be more careful. This is a different hole. He's going to look around. I don't see any blue jays, so I'll, I'll stick it in there, yeah. <laughs> but the real question is, how do the chickadees remember where their seeds are? Uh, well, it turns out they, they get smart. They grow their brains. They grow the hippocampus of their brain. That's the part of your brain that is in charge of memory. And in the fall, the hippocampus increases by 30% so that they can remember where they cached all these, these seeds. And then after they find them in the spring, it shrinks, they get stupid again. <laughs> the important point here is that your chickadee is not gonna be able to make it through the winter, even if you put out your seeds, if you don't give it a place to successfully stash those, those seeds. So we, are, we humans are into neatness. We think if, if the landscape isn't completely controlled and neat that, that I don't know what, something terrible is going to happen. Shows we've lost this battle with, with nature. Um, leave a little roughness, and then you can do this in the backyard again. Some of those, uh, um, you know, a log pile or something, so the chickadees can actually store their, their foods. Don't worry about Mr. Blue Jay. He's going to live off the acorns that, that uh, you're providing with your, your various oak trees. It turns out that, that Blue Jays have a mutualistic relationship with uh, oak trees. Um, they, they eat the acorns in the wintertime, and uh, they, uh, they don't 
cache them in piles like the chickadee. They store them individually. Um, and they can carry several at, at a time. They'll pick one up. They store it, but then they'll fly up to two miles away, and then they pound it down into the ground. What they're doing is planting that acorn. And if they don't remember where it is, it's going to germinate. Um, and then in the wintertime, they've got to go remember where they are and, and, and pull them up. Well, a single jay can bury 4,500 acorns uh, each fall. That's a single, a single jay. Here's one. He's got them all in his crop and everything else flying away. But he's not as smart as the chickadee. He only remembers where one in four of them are. So he's actually planted 3,360 <laughs> oak trees every year. And we, we, saw, we learned this at home because we'd pull out a multiflora rose uh, bush, and here's a big uh, disturbed area. And all of a sudden, an oak tree's growing up the next spring. Where'd they come from? You know, well, the, the blue jays are coming and, and planting them. All right, it is winter time. Um, and again, you could say, I don't have to worry about my chickadees because I'm putting out the seed. Ah, but then I go to grandma's house or I go visit the kids for two weeks in December where I don't put the seeds out. What's the chickadee going to do then? He's got to do what he used to do in the old days, and that is live off the land. Uh, so he's got his cash seeds, but on those really cold nights, he needs a real shot of, of fat. And he needs to go back to those insects. So things like the, the uh, uh, larva that is in the goldenrod gall. That swelling there in your goldenrod stem is the goldenrod gall. It's made by the goldenrod gall fly, and it's extremely high in protein and fat. That little shot of protein and fat gets the chickadee through those, those cold nights. So they find these things, and they peck at them. And it's very hard to find a goldenrod gall in the spring that hasn't been eaten by a chickadee or a titmouse or a, a uh, downy woodpecker. These are really important components of your winter landscape, but only if you leave them there. So again, if you level any natural area, uh, you're really hurting those, those birds. Bagworms. Nobody likes bagworms, and, and I understand why, but look who does. Another really important food source for, for these chickadees during the winter time. So leave a few bagworms out there for the chickadees. Okay, can landscapes like this support uh, our chickadees? Well, of course not. Um, you know, we've measured our landscapes in Northeast Maryland and Southeast Pennsylvania and Delaware. 92% of the area that could be landscaped is lawn. It looks just like that. There's only 10% of the tree biomass that could be there. And look what the trees are. They're Bradford pears. They're calorie pears. Uh, and 80% of the plants that, that we have in our managed landscapes like this are plants from, from Asia. Um, and we are celebrating this. This guy sent me, a, Bill Rupert sent me this slide yesterday. I don't know if you can read that. This is Lawn of the Week. <laughs> or no, it's Lawn of the Month. Yeah, the organizations go around and, and celebrate the fact that we've, we've created dead ecosystems. So we've, we've got a little, way, with, little ways to go here in, in, in cultural change. Um, this is habitat loss. This is not Lawn of the Month. It's habitat loss. Uh, and it explains why we've wrecked our watersheds, why we're not sequestering carbon, why our food webs are collapsing, why we are losing our pollinators. None of that is happening here on this, this property. So we've got to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. You know, in the past, we've asked them to be pretty. We think plants are decorations because they are beautiful decorations, but they're also critical ecological components. Uh, all, everything starts from plants because everything starts from the sun, and they're the only things that can harness that, that energy. Um, so our landscapes can be pretty, but they also need to support life. They also need to sequester carbon. They've got to manage our watersheds. Every one of you lives in a watershed. Nobody has the ethical right to opt out of watershed management like he's done. He says, I'm not going to play that game. How can he get away with that? Enrich our soils, support our pollinators. All those things have to happen at home because we don't have enough nature out there anymore. And up here in Maine, that's, that's a hard argument to convince people of. But come down where I live. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So you don't have to save biodiversity for, for a living, but uh, please consider saving it where you live, not just here on the, on the Audubon property. Um, if we plant for chickadees, we really can save an awful lot of our, our fellow earthlings. Uh, and we can do it right at home. Now, who's going to do this? Who's going to do this? Everybody says it's going to be Oscar, my grandson. <laughs> now, he is studying his guide to wildlife sounds. and. <laughs> And he's into that. He, he likes that better than his, his peanut butter sandwich. And, and, and they're right. You know, we have to teach Oscar, but we can't wait for Oscar. And we're going to wait another whole generation. We're over the carrying capacity, folks, of, of the planet, and we need to act right now. We've got we've to stop destroying things where we live. We've got to toss the idea that humans are here and nature someplace else. 
We're going to be we're going to be together. Thank you. You had a question. <laughs> voluntarily went about and did this in their own yard. But doesn't this ultimately have to become a part of public policy? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And it, and it is, actually. Um, Reston, Virginia, several years ago, made it a policy that every planning on public land will be, will be native. Uh, the, the problem today, of course, is, is again, our culture. Top-down regulation is not real real uh, um, popular. If the government says you have to do it, people fight against it just because the government said you had to do it. Forget how much sense it makes. So I think bottom-up change is, is uh, it's certainly going to be more popular and, and might happen faster. But there, there are a number of states that are starting to ban the sale of some of these invasive plants. Of course, the, you know, the horse is out of the barn, and we're going to close the door now, but it's a step. It's a step. So in Massachusetts, I think, they can't sell uh, burning bush anymore. In Oregon, they can't sell uh, English ivy. So, you know, it's, it makes no sense. The state is covered with English ivy. It doesn't matter anymore, and nobody's buying it. But, but at least, you know, they're thinking in the right direction. We could turn it around on a dime if we paid people for producing ecosystem services at home by reducing taxes. Oh, you have this much lawn? Or, oh, you've cut your lawn in half, here's the benefit of doing that. You've sequestered this much carbon, you've helped manage the watershed, all the things we all need to be doing. And it doesn't have to be much, it's just a recognition that those are important things, they're not valueless. That would turn it around on, on a dime. Yes? Can you speak to um, the consideration of the benefits versus the disadvantages of treating non-natives Primarily invasive non-natives with herbicides. Ah, <laughs> well, the old herbicide question. Primarily glyphosate. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Right. Um, what do I think about treating non-native plants with with herbicides, pri primarily Roundup or glyphosate? I uh, I can I can tell you stories. You know, we bought our property ten acres completely covered with invasives. And it became the family goal, we're going to get rid of these. And we're not going to use herbicide. So I had, I had bittersweet this thick growing up a tree, and I ran out the day we signed the papers. I cut it off. I didn't treat it with anything. And the next year, I had 80,000 bittersweet coming up from the rootstock because I did not kill the rootstock. I pulled out my multiflora rose with chains around the base of them uh, with the tractor, and it was great fun and out they came but they left the roots all around a circle then up each each one came I cut my my autumn olive off and I was going to make I had, we had a big deer problem so I have these cages around my my uh, all my plants that I want to save I had these autumn olive stakes laid out all summer just laying there drying up in the fall I pounded them in they all they all germinated <laughs> I decided I am not going to live long enough to have to go back and do it again and again and again and again. So what I do is I do use herbicide, but I use as little as possible. I don't spray because there's always some non-target around that, that I don't want to hit. So what I do is I cut them off at the base and I, and I paint it. It's using just a tiny little bit. Um, and people say, oh, you know, you're going to poison the world. I can't even kill what I'm painting. So I, I haven't been convinced of that, but I'd really like to do some actual soil studies to see whether anything right next to any of, any of the, the you know, soil ecosystem right next to where I painted has been, been contaminated. But I have found that if you don't kill the rootstock, you don't kill it, and then you're going at it forever, and then people get discouraged, and it doesn't happen, and they take over the world. So there are some, for small-scale controls, excuse me, you can put black plastic on for a couple years, uh, and try to try to starve them of sunlight. You can repeatedly cut something. I, I ran into a group in New York who's controlling nightweeds, Japanese knotweed. Uh, it's not a big band. It's a band from about the chair here to the wall that goes along a stream, and they have a whole team that goes out. And every two weeks, with scissors, they cut it cut it down. Every two weeks, they're in their third year, and now it's much smaller than it used to be. They're exhausting the root system. 
They're exhausting the rich system. So in theory, they will win, but it's a lot of labor. So, but in that same regard, um, you know, the bigger picture, is it possible that the disadvantage of pesticide use is greater than the disadvantage of being overrun by it permanently by these non-natives, which eventually people say will evolve to have predators? Okay, let's talk about that. All right, how, when does a non-native become a native? You know, Phragmites, the well, common read? No, an invasive. All because right. You know, the definition of an invasive plant is a non-native plant that's aggressively displacing native plants. Okay, so they'll stop being aggressive when they get a, enough things eating them, like all the other natives. Phragmites has been here 400 years. In Europe, 170 species eat it here, five, after 400 years. So will things eventually adapt? Yes, uh, but we're talking about tens of thousands of years. And in the meantime, ecosystem havoc. In the meantime, you know, tremendous loss of, of species richness. There's a lot of things I didn't get to tell you tonight, but the number of species in your ecosystem uh, are the, is, is what determines how well that ecosystem functions. When we move things around the world, we create what, what ecologists call novel ecosystems. All of the specialized relationships that are nature drop out of those novel ecosystems because they don't, they don't know each other. So then you've got a species poor environment and they're gone. So yeah, eventually the diversity will build up, but you're talking about you know, so many thousands of years. And if this happens all over the world, which it is, you're talking about the sixth ex extinction. So is that better than using herbicide responsibly? I would say no, it's not. But that's my personal opinion, yes. So um, one of the problems is finding a place to buy some of the plants that you've listed as desirable. There are a couple of very good nurseries around here, and they will put out a cultivar as a native. It's bigger, taller, prettier. So how do you, other than planting our own oak trees and trying to find spice bush seeds to plant, how do you get nurseries to be more responsive to carrying the kinds of plants that we should be putting in our yards? Okay, you got a couple of questions there. Where do you get these plants, first of all? And I didn't mention on that website, the, the National Wildlife Federation website that's gonna have the native plant finder, they're also listing local sources of these plants. So that's gonna be very, very useful. How do you get nurseries to carry more of these plants? They will carry plants that sell. Um, they're not in the business of, of um, well, they don't care whether it's a plant from Asia or a plant from Africa or a plant from North America if it sells. So this is all gonna be determined by the marketplace. If you go to the nursery and you say, I want uh, a spice bush that is not a cultivar. Oh, you don't have one? Goodbye. I will go someplace else that, that does. And if enough people do that, there's a, the guy will say, I better get spice bush that's not a, not a cultivar. Uh, so they just wanna sell a plant. Again, they're not evil people, they're in business. They've got to stay in business by selling plants. You guys can buy those plants. And the biggest problem is that there, as this, this uh, native plant movement grows, there are not enough nurseries around making these. Uh, there's a guy in the Midwest, Merv Wallace, who's been in the native plant business since the 80s, and I've asked him how business is, and he, he gave me a chart the last time I saw him. It goes like this. He says, I can't keep up. Every year, it, you know, he's doubling his, his sales. And he's in his 80s at this point. We need more people growing native plants to meet the growing demand because there's an awful lot of people that are seeing, seeing the wisdom in it. Um, the cultivar issue is, is uh, you know, a lot of people studying that now, in, including us. We've got a project uh, being funded by Mount Cuba Center trying to answer the question, are cultivars as good as the straight species? So first of all, most cultivars, whether they're genetic variants found in nature or whether they're actively selected, are propagated clonally which means there's zero genetic variability. And we know putting zero genetic variability in the landscape is not a good idea. Uh, but if we get past that, um, it depends on what the genetic trait is that has changed compared to the straight species, whether or not it's gonna be ecologically as good. So uh, Acer rubrum October glory is a genetic variant that somebody found a really red, red maple in the fall uh, and they 
put a name on it. Nature created it. Uh, it is propagated clonally, but does that support as many insects? Yes, it does. Um, does a, a tall plant that's made into a short plant support as many insects? Our research says it does. Does a plant that you, you take a green leaf and you make it a purple leaf? No, it doesn't. <laughs> because then you've changed the leaf chemistry. You've added anthocyanins to, to that leaf. So we, we're very fond of purple leaf cultivars, including your Norway maple, which is all over Portland, I see. Um, but that really reduces what, what insects might eat it. Most of our cultivars focus on flowers. But when you change the flower shape, um, you make petals bigger, typically, or you change the color, you're, you're often fooling with the energy budget of the flower. Uh, so the flower has this much energy. It can put it into petals and nectar and pollen. If you make the petals huge, there's usually less nectar and, and pollen. That will impact the, the pollinators. Um, but you could make a cultivar with twice as much nectar. You could make echinacea nectar plenty and, and say this is gonna attract butterflies. And you know what, people would buy it. I don't care how ugly it is. People would buy it because they love those, those butterflies. So thinking of cultivars in terms of function instead of just what it looks like would be a new way to do it. The, the other thing I don't like about cult, the cultivar issue is that it promotes the idea that plants are just decorations. They're the foundation of all our life. We, we can have pretty plants, but we've got to think about function first, not promote this idea that we're, it's just how pretty they are. Yes? How could I tell if willows in my yard are the good willows or non-native willows? Um, so what non-native willows do you have up here? You've got weeping willow, right? These are not weeping willows, but I, I don't know. I think up here most of the willows are going to be native. Who's going to help me out with that? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a variegated, there's a very common variegated willow around here called the Mishiki willow. And then you oh, Japanese it. willow? Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. yeah, I've never heard of it. You know, we have looked at, at the issue of congeneric non-native plants. So when you take a, a, a plant from Europe that's in the same genus as a plant from North America, like Norway maple compared to red maple, they're in the same genus. So the prediction is the chemistry they're using ought to be pretty similar. So if we have native insects that are adapted to, to um, maple chemistry here, they ought to be able to use those European maples um, at least somewhat because they're so similar. That's, that's the prediction. And we, we did 18 comparisons, congeneric comparisons that way. Uh, and the answer was that the insect use was reduced 50% on the non-natives. It was more than we thought. But it's better than, than if it's not closely related, where it's reduced 75%. Those were averages. There were some plant genera where it didn't seem to make a difference, and willow was one of them. So, now I don't know about the Japanese one. Um, but I do know we compared weeping willow with black willow. There was no difference. So. But if you know, if you can identify the, the Japanese willow, put in the native willow. You've got plenty of native willows. Don't take a chance. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, just to come back to the woman's question about um, <laughs> nurseries and where to get native plants, um, I know it's an issue, but um, in Maine, there's the, the soil and water conservation districts all have plant sales in the spring, and most of them are really going towards ever towards natives. They're smaller plants, but they're healthy. They're great. They're inexpensive. You can go online and look it up, and you know. Good. You know, a lot of people uh, have have been um, discouraged because for a long time the source of these native plants have been these plant sales. Uh, and a lot of, of uh, conservation organizations and nature centers or something are using native plant sales as fundraisers. So they jack the price way up. And people say, I can't afford these native plants. Um, it's an eco economy of scale. When we, when we get the demand up and we start producing them uh, in much greater numbers, that, those prices will come yeah, down. Yeah, they, they have great prices. Good, good. Yes? When I read about herbicides, on um, pesticides, is it in a biodiverse system? They're not needed because oh, yeah. uh, the diversity takes care of things. It, it wants the good bugs. It, it right. Bugs. So you're 
you know, there's herbicides to, to fight these non-native plants, which are not in control. They're not part of the ecosystems because nothing's eating them, versus insecticides to keep your pests in, in control. We've actually looked at, at pest damage on primarily native properties versus primarily, uh, well, we call them typical properties. Usually the canopy's native and all the understory is, is non-native. Uh, and looked at damage levels to see uh, whether the native properties are being eaten, eaten to death. They're not. The damage level's uh, uh, statistically the same. It's a little bit lower on the native properties, but statistically it's, it's the same. Why is that? You've got all those caterpillars out there because you've got all the birds eating those caterpillars. You've got all the natural enemies keeping them control. So you've got a lot of life based on keeping that, that trophic level, the caterpillars, under control. So you're absolutely right. You don't need the, the uh, pesticides, the insecticides, generally to keep things in, in balance. Now that's not true for all these insects from someplace else, which are this, just as bad as the plants from someplace else. They're here without their natural enemies. But yeah, in most cases, people, a lot of people say, you don't talk about insecticides. I'm trying to make insects here, folks. We're not trying to, to kill them. <laughs> so there's usually no need for them, yes. <laughs> If we have sort of limits on, you know, how many new plants we're going to put in or what we want to focus on, as far north as we are, should we be focused more on the bird, what the birds need during their breeding period than during their migrating period? Or do we still have a lot of migrators here? Oh, you, yeah. I don't know my birds very well. No, you have a lot of migrants, particularly here on the coast. Um, most of our warblers move North, now you are north, and a lot of them stay and breed here, but they certainly move through my property, and they'll breed in the boreal forest. You have a number of species that go farther north, and they follow the coastline, so you are in a very important migrating zone. Um, should you worry about the, the breeding birds as well? Absolutely, because you've got a lot, of, a lot of birds that stop and breed here too. But you know what? You can do both things at the same time with the same plants. So it's not like the migrants want one set of plants and the breeders want another set of plants. Just put in those foraging hubs and you, you've got both of them covered. Yes? Coming back to the, the painting, the roundup on the invasives, have you had enough time or experience to see whether when you have used that, do other things come up there? And oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it's a, I mean, yeah, there's no big dead zone around it. No, and as I say, I, I typically have to go back and paint it more than once, depending on the size of the of the rootstock. I am not going like this. On it. I am painting it. It's very little material, and it gets down into the roots. But like Oriental bittersweet, its roots go forever, and, and usually you can't get enough material in one place to kill the whole root system. So it'll come up in another another place. But uh, I have not seen any collateral damage from painting, and we've been doing it for 15 years. I was wondering if you know if there are any kind of regulations in the TPP put forth by the corporate controlled international companies that would limit the growth of our ability to, to, to bring in, to, to foster local policies and make sure that we're getting able to get the local things. Yeah, good question. I have, I have no idea. I had never thought that that could be a possibility, but it, maybe it is. I don't, I don't know. I know Bernie's trying to keep it in the platform. Yeah, yeah I, platform. I don't. Uh, for the plant issue, I never, never entered my mind. The horticultural lobby is a, is a powerful one. But again, all they want to do is, is sell plants. Early on, I had a nurseryman sitting in, in the front row. His arms are crossed. He said, you're trying to put us out of business. And I wasn't smart enough to think of what to say until I was driving home. <laughs> we have, we have, what is it? Now I forget my statistics. St st 210 million homes, something like that, in the country. If they all re-landscaped, that's a business opportunity. We're not talking about putting you out of business here. So, yes. I can comment on the uh, uh, regulations in that. Even though I'm from Michigan, one of the stumbling blocks for us are local weed ordinances. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because all natives are considered to be weeds. And that isn't any big business or corporate influence. That's decades old influence from when this was farmland, and farmers didn't want people that have weeds <coughs> on their property that can get in and contaminate their fields. 
So if you want to do something on a local level, get in there and defeat the local weed ordinance, get it erased from the books. And then you can convert your front yard into prairie or your backyard into whatever. And well, now, it's, now, it's well, it. now it's not about you know keeping the weeds out of the farmer's field. It's about making sure you don't reduce your property value, because a lot of people think if you grow native plants, it's you're giving up landscaping. You're you know you're banning the place, and it's just going to be this jungle, and it'll be low class, and you can't sell, and the whole neighborhood will go downhill, and and that's that's the feeling. So they've got these rules: the grass has to be cut. You know you've got to act like like you're not a communist and you're a good citizen. Um, so when you do things, be sensitive to, to the culture at this point and, and make it ecologically powerful landscape, but make it pretty at the same time. It's, you can do that. You can do that. Yes. <laughs> I just wondered if you had any insight on um, how to deal with invasive birds. I, I have like, been landscaped for years trying to get more birds, and I seem to just always have two dominant species, and that's, I think it's the um, field sparrow and the star. You mean the house sparrow? Mm -hmm. The house sparrow. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. <sighs> Yeah, of course, we brought house sparrow and starling over in the late 1800s because we wanted it to look like England. Who was the guy he, he wanted to see how many species from Shakespeare he could introduce into the US? Most of them failed, but not the house sparrow and not the starling. And um, uh, they both rely heavily on agricultural settings uh, where they're, so, so the house sparrow is really a finch. I said 96% of our birds feed their young insects. Well, finches feed them seeds. So they're usually very numerous where you've got somebody producing grain uh, and there's a lot of, lot of seeds around. So when we actually moved into our, our property, we had a house sparrow problem. Um, it's disappeared because I'm not making any, any grain anymore and I have no house sparrows at, at all. So it depends on where you live, where they're coming from. A lot of times they're very common in cities because we've got people with breadcrumbs and everything keeping them going. Starlings are real omnivores too, but they're always associated. You get these huge uh, blackbird flocks, most of which are starlings, again, with, with the production of corn and, and uh, a lot of seeds. So um, that's where they're coming from. You don't, again, I don't have a starling issue either. Even though I've got a lot of bluebird boxes up in the, the type of hole that they're usually competing for, no starlings at all. Um, and it's not very far away where there's a lot of starlings. So I think if you control your local surroundings, you can reduce those, those birds. It's not very far. Um, so would, that, would it make sense not to put out bird feeders? <laughs> yeah, you know the only time. Well, house sparrows for. I never have house sparrows at, at feeders. Do people get house sparrows at their feeders? Maybe. I would use. How about how about at sunflower? Say I think I think they come to the millet and that smaller stuff. Try sunflowers and 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 see if that works. But in the later the late winter, there's that's when the blackbird flocks come, the red-winged blackbirds and the, and the grackles and the starlings, and they'll hit your feeder and empty it in, in two minutes. Um, when that happens repeatedly, and it's usually late winter, uh, I, I take the, the feeders in until they go away. It, yeah, that is an issue. Surely you people want to go home. <laughs> we got all night. You got all night, uh, okay, okay. <laughs>